Welcome to Beneath the Bible, where we're helping you dig deeper and uncover the world beneath the sacred book. In the Bible, the people of God are typically the main characters of the story. In the Old Testament, this is usually the people of Israel, and in the New Testament, it's the followers of Jesus. But the people of God are one part of a much larger cast of characters. Some of these other people and people groups assist the people of God, but more often they serve as antagonists. Now, understandably, the Bible tells us quite a bit more about the people of God than it does the other players in the story. But knowing who these other people are can help give us some depth and additional insights into the biblical text. In today's video, we're continuing our periodic series on the people groups of the Bible. Today, we're going to look at the Edomites. The Edomites are one of the neighboring and frequent antagonists of ancient Israel, residents of a land called Edom. Now, the name Edom comes from a Semitic word meaning red or ruddy. This name is probably related to the bleak, stony red landscape of their land. The region of Edom is somewhat ill-defined, and its borders shifted as the polity of Edom developed. The Bible uses Edom to refer to the semi-arid and desert land south of the Dead Sea, sometimes called the Arabah as well as the land southeast of the Dead Sea. It included southern Transjordan as well, at times, and some land approaching the Negev up to the southern border of Judah. The capital of Edom was the city that the Bible calls Bozrah. The Bible uses alternative names for Edom as well. Edom may also be called Seir and Teman. Seir seems to be simply synonymous with Edom in places like Genesis 32 and Judges 5. Teman also seems to be Edom in Amos 1.12, and notably one of Job's friends is Eliphaz the Temnite. Now, it's been suggested that Seir and Teman are not names for the same place, but are districts or specific places within Edom. Now, while this is possible, it seems more likely to us that they all refer to roughly the same thing, though we should certainly consider that the Israelites didn't bother to differentiate between them, even if they were aware of the differences. Edom and the Edomites were understood to be descendants of Esau, the older twin of Jacob, son of Isaac, and the grandson of Abraham. Genesis 36.1 plainly says Esau, that is, Edom. Identifying the ancestry of Israel's neighbors is a recurring theme in Genesis. Now, usually these other people groups are given embarrassing or bad origin stories to explain why their descendants are such evil people like how the Ammonites and the Moabites are the descendants of Lot's taboo relation with his daughters. With the Edomites, the relationship between their ancestors and the Israelites is particularly close. Moab and Ammon were the grandsons of Lot, Abraham's nephews, so they were understood as related to the Israelites, but somewhat distantly. Now, by contrast, the children of Israel, or Jacob, and the descendants of Esau were understood to be much closer kin. Amos 1 refers to Edom as the brother of Israel, and Deuteronomy 23 indicates that Edomites apparently did not have the same restrictions on worshiping at the temple in Jerusalem as the Moabites and the Ammonites did. But as those of you with siblings know, close relations don't always translate to amicable relations. The kingdoms of Israel and Judah frequently fought with Edom. Saul and David fought against the Edomites in the Arabah. One victory is mentioned in the Valley of Salt, possibly somewhere south of Beersheba. The Bible says that the victory gave David control of the Arabah south to the Gulf of Aqaba. During the reign of Solomon, an exiled king of Edom returned from Egypt and antagonized Solomon's trade routes. Edom again fell to Judahite control under Jehoshaphat before gaining independence under his son Joram, with Amaziah later claiming control over Edom once again. Now, ultimately, the Edomites fell under the influence of the Assyrians and later the Babylonians. The short book of Obadiah may refer to the Edomites helping either the Arabs or Babylonians attack Judah. Now, this was taken as a particularly egregious insult, since the Edomites and the Israelites were supposed to be brothers. Brothers may bicker and quarrel, but they don't destroy each other. The name Edom disappears after the Old Testament, and this region is referred to as Idumea in the New Testament. And we should note, however, that Idumea is not fully analogous with the Old Testament Edom. The two territories overlap, but they do not share all of the same boundaries. What we know about the Edomites from outside the Bible can be roughly divided into two periods. The periods of the chiefs and the periods of the kings. 
Transition between these two periods is sometime in the late 9th century, around the time when the Kingdom of Israel became divided. Now, these two events aren't related, but the division and weakening of Israel may have allowed for the strengthening of Edom during its period of the king. The period of the chiefs is in the Late Bronze Age, with tribally organized nomads in the land south of the Dead Sea. Egyptian records mention a group they called Shasu, a name derived from a word meaning either plunderer or more likely wanderer. The term Shasu is best understood as a social category rather than an ethnonym, or a name for a specific ethnicity or people group. And many ethnicities could be categorized as Shasu, but notably there are six groups of Shasu listed in an inscription dated to the reign of Amenhotep III. This inscription includes Shasu of Sir and Yahweh. Now, these names are probably locating where these particular tribes or clans of Shasu originated. Both Seir and Yahweh may both be referencing mountains, possibly sacred mountains. And we can see this in a Marna letter sent from a king in Jerusalem in the 14th century which mentions Mount Seir. In Papyrus Anastasi VI, dating to the reign of Pharaoh Merneptah, an Egyptian official mentions the Shasu tribes of Edom, and passing into Egypt in search of greener pastures for their herds. And the later Ramses III is recorded in Papyrus Anastasi I as fighting against the Shasu of Seir and giving them as slaves to Egyptian temples. The Shasu of Seir are probably best understood as the progenitors of the people the Bible calls Edomites. What probably jumped out to you, though, was the name Shasu of Yahweh. You didn't think I'd just gloss over that one, did you? There's a lot of debate about what Shasu of Yahweh actually means. Some are that Shasu of Yahweh were, were those who worship Yahweh, and possibly on his holy mountain, what the Bible calls either Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb. And places like Judges 5 and Deuteronomy 33 might imply worship of Yahweh beginning in Sire or the land of Edom. Now, other scholars reject this interpretation and don't see Yahweh of the Egyptian sources as referencing the Yahweh of the Bible at all. We don't have time to get into this or in all these arguments in this video, but we did want to note that identifying the Shasu of Yahweh may not be as straightforward as it seems. So back to the Edomites. The Late Bronze Age and the Early Iron Age were the period of the chiefs. We must rely on non-Edomite sources to inform us about this people group. And nomads are notoriously difficult to locate archaeologically, so finding evidence of the Shasu of Sayer in this period is basically impossible. We don't know what they called themselves or how they organized themselves, and all we can really say is that in some names which appear in Egyptian inscriptions, they have what are called theophoric elements of a god named Kaus. And theophoric names include a name or part of a name of a god in them. For example, Obadiah is the Hebrew word for servant and Yah, which is short for Yahweh. For the Edomites, Kaus appears in some late Bronze Age names of these Shasu, and we know from later sources that this same god was popular among the Edomites in the Iron Age. In the early Iron Age, we start to find more evidence of the Edomites archaeologically. This marks the transition from the period of the chiefs to the period of the kings. And these Shasu of Sa'ir are becoming less nomadic and establishing larger, more permanent settlements. So there's a lot more archaeological evidence from this period. We're learning more and more every year as more and more excavations occur, but we still have quite a few gaps in our understanding of the history of Edom. What we can say is that during this period, nearly all areas of what is now Israel and Jordan saw a wave of settlers, even the ecologically marginal areas southwest of the Dead Sea. This is the land of Seir, and between 1200 and 1000, it saw several small villages and new settlements appear. Because of the rough terrain and ecology, these remained small villages and hamlets, and nomadism was surely still an important part of the Edomite society. Tensions arose between these people and the early kingdom of Judah in the north in the 10th century, probably over control of important trade routes up the Jordan Rift Valley and into Arabia. These routes known as the King's Highway were very lucrative, and kingdoms like Israel and Judah sought to control them. And Judah was dominant over the Edomites at this point, but perhaps by the 9th century and certainly by the late 8th, Edom developed into its own kingdom. And this development may have occurred because of what archaeologists call a peer polity interaction, where competition between two groups can lead to one group emulating or copying from another. In the later Iron Age, around the 7th century, Edom began to expand its influence and control, particularly north and west into the area of the Negev, even around the Judahite city of Beersheba. Their prosperity was accomplished in part through the extraction of copper from the Wadi Fainan. It's estimated that between the 11th and 8th centuries, these mines were so active that they produced over 100,000 tons of slag, and slag is a byproduct of the smelting process. Now, additionally, with the domestication of camels, the desert trade routes through Edom into Arabia were quite lucrative, and trading aromatics like frankincense and other incenses. And Edom remained relatively rural even during this period of prosperity. Only one city, Butsera, is really considered an urban center, and even then, almost half the site is temples and palaces rather than residential dwellings like a city like we might imagine. 
As Edom was brought into the wider Near Eastern Imperial world, it became and remained a loyal vassal of the Imperial powers like Assyria. Now, that loyalty kept them interconnected with the Imperial economy, which further enhanced their prosperity. Rebellion was a risky venture in the ancient world. Independence could bring greater prosperity, but a failed rebellion meant increased suffering, a lesson that Judah learned several times. It's unclear exactly how the Edomites fared during the transition from Assyrian to Babylonian rule. It's possible that early in the transition, the Edomites were able to expand their influence into southern Judah even further, into a region which would later be called Idumea. Notably, King Herod the Great was from Idumea. The Edomite kingdom came to an end in the mid-6th century, probably during the reign of the Babylonian king Nabonidus. We see its demise described in Obadiah. And this is also pretty clear archaeologically, where sites like their capital Butzera, sites like Tawilan, Um al Biara, and Tel al-Khalifa were burned. A final piece of Edomite history comes from the few pieces we have to trace their language development. We don't have any Edomite royal inscriptions like we do from several of their neighbors, but we do have some other inscriptions in Edomite. From these, we can see the Edomites used the Phoenician script, and their language was quite similar to Hebrew. As they became more interconnected with the Assyrian world, they adopted more Aramaic linguistic customs. We have several ostraca, or pieces of pottery with ink writing on them, which have Edomite scripts on them. But again, we have very little of their own writing to help us reconstruct their society. From non-Edomite sources, scholars have constructed a tentative king list, which goes from the late 9th century down to the mid-6th century. The history of the Edomite language parallels the history of the Edomites themselves, with Semitic origins developing with greater prosperity and influence from Assyria until they were absorbed into the powerful empires around them. Like the Canaanites, the Edomites are an important and frequently mentioned people group in the Old Testament, as one of Israel's closest neighbors and main rivals. The relationship between Israel and Edom is notable because their histories have many parallels. Emerging from nomadic life to more structured settlements, rising in strength, before being conquered by the more powerful empires vying for control of their lands. Now, in many ways, Israel and Edom were brothers, facing the same challenges while navigating their own sibling rivalry before succumbing to similar fates. The difference, of course, is that while Edom faded away, Israel experienced a resurrection, emerging from exile to again take up the challenge of surviving as the little brother in a world of giants. Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. If you want to learn more about this topic, we've included some references and resources in the description below. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more content like it, be sure to subscribe to our channel, give this video a like, and follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Beneath the Bible. If you learned something new today, take a minute to share this video with your friends. And until next time, keep digging.